we are we are here today, everyone. Um, Amplifying her voice is celebrating in Moms We Trust, and I am thrilled to be welcoming our keynote speaker, Rianne Eisler, today, um, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting a couple years ago at a dinner event in Bretton Woods, um, and she and she gave her keynote, and it's probably the only keynote of my life where I started crying and said, you know, this woman is 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 one of the greatest minds of our generation. And if there was a way for us to bring her back and share her wisdom, um, I will find her someday. And I reached out a couple months ago and, and asked her again, can you please come and address this important topic on Mother's Day because of your work and everything that you have spent your life and your career on is so timely given this pandemic. And we have a couple conversations that are going to follow Rianne's talk that are gonna lead into our, our panel on the Marshall Plan for Moms, but I'm really interested to see um, what uh, Rianne is going to present today. Kate Byrne is with us. Um, she was supposed to give the introduction. Let's see if her connection is gonna work, and if so, I'm gonna hand it to Kate. I just stepped in in case Kate couldn't join because of technical difficulties. So I'm letting Kate in, Rianne, one second. Yes. Let's see, Let's see if, if her connection will cooperate. See, I've been having a happy yeah. time. You're here. Hey. Hey. No, welcome. welcome, welcome. Thank you. And I apologize. I'm just going to stay on just in case we have technical problems, Kate. Sure. But go ahead. Appreciate it. I have had the challenges of a lifetime this morning. I was the woman of, the, I was the voice of the goddess. Something that Rianne Eisler, I should say, Dr. Rianne Eisler knows all too well. Um, welcome everyone. I am Kate Byrne and I'm the CEO of Catapult X and the editor of which is a um, piece and part of Media Village. And I really, my voice just went out. Okay, I've done everything I can. So I'm gonna continue to be a fabulous goddess. You got to see how cute I look. Anyway, back <laughs> to the woman of the hour. Um, Rian, is a force of nature. She, for anyone who's involved in studies, feminist studies, um, systemic change, you will be very familiar of the work of Dr. Rianne Eisler, a social scientist. She is a lawyer. She is an author. Her Us in the Blade, um, The Nurturing of Our Nation, all our Bibles to those who are really, really working and looking at new ways of fixing and healing the the world that we know that the world know and that we love and that is not necessarily supportive to over half of the population. That being many of the faces who are joining us today. You know, um, I was going to say that what well, you need to do more. Dr. Rianne Eisler, because clearly you're a slacker. You aren't doing enough. But secondly, that, you know, uh, last year we were unfortunate to lose our beloved, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg and um, our RBG. And I would say that we definitely have someone who can fill those shoes in Dr. R.E. So with that, Rianne, Welcome, welcome, and please share your pearls of wisdom and inspire us as um, we talk today. Well, thank you so much, Kate, uh, for that lovely introduction, and also Anu. And, and Anu, I want to thank also, well, both of you and all of you who have really worked so hard on well, making this important conference happen for everything that you're doing. And of course, I'm delighted to be here with you uh, to talk with you about the opportunity and the urgent need for building the kind of economic system that moms, and I should add all of us, urgently need, a caring economics of partnerism that values and rewards caring for people starting at birth and caring for our natural world. And I know partnerism is probably a new word for 
some of you. Um, but think about it. Einstein said it. He said, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. We need new thinking. We need new words to really because we know from linguistic psychologists that the our language, the words available in our language channel our thinking. So it's almost impossible to visualize other possibilities. And that is uh, what my work has really been about for over four decades now. And as those of you familiar with it, as Kate said, I'm a social scientist, I'm a cultural historian, a futurist, and I have really devoted my research and my writing and speaking and activism to help us move to a more equitable, sustainable, and caring world. And that's, that's my life's work. And I have a lot of passion for it, which, um, as I will uh, briefly tell you about, is really deeply rooted in my own early life experiences as with my parents, a child refugee from the Holocaust. And uh, I, 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 I also want to say that this passion is also animated by what we know, uh, the unprecedented challenges, climate change, terrible inequality, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to propose to you uh, what really uh, one of the themes of this conference is, that the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a crisis, that it's an opportunity, uh, an opportunity uh, to really re-evaluate and change, change uh, our current rules. Uh, and what I'm going to be focusing on uh, are our current economic thinking and rules. Um, and because, you know, we hear so much about returning to normal. And the first thing we need to do is to say, no, we don't want to really return to the old normal where even before this pandemic in this wealthy United States where I live, one quarter of all children live in poverty. Uh, we don't want to go back to the devastating personal costs, uh, the stress, uh, the lack of support for moms and other uh, caregivers. Uh, we don't want to go back to a system where care work in the market is performed for poverty wages, mostly by women of color uh, in the United States and much of the world, and for free, for free in households by moms and other caregivers. So how do we change this and move forward? And that's what I'm going to be talking with you about. But first, I'm going to tell you a little about myself because people always want to know, well, what led you to this work, to tackling all of this? And uh, as I said, um, uh, well, I was a, a child refugee from the Holocaust with my parents uh, from Nazi Europe. And that was after Crystal Night, when a gang of Gestapo men uh, Crystal Night is so called because of all the glass that was shattered in uh, Jewish homes. In um, oh, I just got a message. I'm back, and I was telling you a little bit about what really led me to this work. And I I was telling you about Crystal Night, so called because of all the glass that was shattered that night, which was the official night of uh, the first really night of terror against Jews in both Germany and my native Austria, Vienna, where I was born. Uh, and a gang of Gestapo men came to our house and they dragged my father off. So I witnessed cruelty, insensitivity, uh, but I also saw something else that night that has really stayed with me. 
And it's what I today call spiritual courage. And no, it's not the courage to slay the dragon, you know, out of anger or hate. It's the courage to challenge injustice out of love. And my mother displayed that courage. She recognized one of the uh, Nazis, who, the Gestapo men, uh, as a former errand boy of the family business. And she got furious. She said, how dare you? Do this to this man who has been so kind to you. I want him back. Now, my mother could have been killed. A lot of Jewish people were killed that night. But by a miracle, she wasn't. And to fast forward, by another miracle, we managed to uh, escape Vienna uh, at night, just carrying what we could carry, because, yes, the Nazis confiscated as an official name for armed robbery, uh, everything. But before that, my parents were able to purchase a an entry permit to Cuba, one of the very few places, Shanghai and Cuba, that let in Jewish refugees from the Nazis. And I grew up in the industrial slums of Havana. And there, of course, I experienced, until my parents got on their feet, um, living in poverty, but I also saw all the poverty around me, these enormous gaps between haves and have-nots that were characteristic of Cuba at that time. And that led me to questions that I'm sure all of you have asked at some point in your lives. Does it have to be this way? Uh, when we humans have such a capacity for caring, for consciousness, uh, as I saw in my mother, why has there been so much insensitivity, so much cruelty, so much violence? And eventually, I mean, fast forwarding again, these were the questions that led to my multidisciplinary cross-cultural research. But it wasn't until another pivotal experience that I just very want to touch upon. And that was when I, in the late 1960s, along with thousands of other women um, in the United States and then in Europe and then in other places, began to wake up as if from a long <laughs> drugged sleep, from what I today call the domination trance. And I realized but a lot of things I thought were me. Something's wrong with me, you know, because I don't fit and because it, 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 things don't work properly for me. That, that this wasn't just a personal problem. It was a social problem that I shared with all of these other women. And wow, that was really a big, big awakening. Um, and, and yes, we made some changes. I mean, I threw myself into the feminist movement. Um, I started the first center in the United States on women and the law and talking about the domination trance. We were so brainwashed that people would ask me, women and the law? What in the world does that mean? Well, what it meant uh, was that I had to write through the center uh, of women and the law, a friend of the court brief to the Supreme Court of the United States, making the then radical argument that women, yeah, women should be considered persons under the purview of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And you know what? Uh, they didn't buy it that in that case, but they did in the next case, because, you know, friend of the court briefs are sort of a way of, quote, educating, changing the thinking of the court. And they did change it in the Reed case. And, and, and we did make progress. I mean, look, the, 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 the want ads, for example, I mean, we couldn't even get in the door. You know, today we talk about the glass ceiling. They were segregated into help wanted male and help wanted female with all the dead end jobs, the quote, helper jobs under help wanted female. And the good ones, yeah, help wanted male. And that was just the beginning. But 
Um, oh, and I, I also wrote uh, several books uh, because I have a law degree from, from the UCLA School of Law based on my legal background. Um, really uh, challenging uh, the what we all took for granted, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the systemic, systemic devaluation of women and yes, and this is the point I'm going to get to. Anything stereotypically considered feminine, such as the work that moms do of caring for people, keeping a clean and healthy home environment, which then translates, of course, into keeping a clean and healthy planetary environment. But I'm getting ahead of my story. Because when I started then my research. I wrote the Equal Rights Handbook, I should tell you, which was the only mass paperback um, on the Equal Rights Amendment. And when that simple amendment, you know, all it said was that neither the federal government nor any state may discriminate on the basis of sex. When that got defeated, uh, and I predicted, by the way, that if it did get defeated, I predicted that in the Equal Rights Handbook, which is still unfortunately relevant today, completely relevant. Um, I predicted that if it were defeated, uh, we would see a massive political regression, which we did, didn't we? But to, I, I decided at that point that as important as it is to change laws, and it really is important, we also, have to go deeper. We have to change the culture, the social and economic and value system. And, you know, um, that, of course, led me back to the questions of my childhood. And I realized right away that I couldn't answer these questions through by looking at uh, human society, like, like, what what do we really need to build in order to have a more equitable, more sustainable society that values this work of caring and caregiving? Uh, and, and I realized that I couldn't answer this question of what we need to build uh, by looking at, 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 at human societies, past, present, or future, uh, through the lenses of conventional categories, uh, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, capitalist, socialist. Well, for one thing, if you really think about it, there have been repressive, violent societies in every one of these categories, whether it was Hitler's Germany, a rightist, Western, secular society, or Saudi and former Soviet Union, a leftist uh, secular Western society, or whether it was an Eastern society, whether it was religious or secular, whether it was a religious society like the Taliban, for example, or ISIS, or the rightist fundamentalist alliance in the United States, which is really not religious fundamentalism. It is something much deeper. Anyway, by, by realizing something else, which is fundamental, which is that these conventional categories either marginalize or ignore nothing less than the majority of humanity, women and children, and hence families. Now, I'll get back to that. But what I began to see by just leaving this conventional thinking aside, and I really invite you to do that and change our language, because language, as I said, is so important in terms of changing our thinking of what is possible. What I began to see are configurations, patterns, uh, and they went into sort of two lumps, on one side uh, and on another side in a continuum of what I've called the partnership domination social scale. I saw the configurations of either a domination system, which is what we're trying to leave behind, whether it's Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, capitalist, socialist, or and a partnership system. And yes, what I saw is that in these categories, 
which no longer ignore the majority of humanity, uh, the status of women is key. So we need to really uh, change this evaluation. Uh, I mean, think about it. These categories provide what we have not had, a holistic way of looking at society that we need to move forward. Uh, because as long as we're stuck in the old categories, which a colleague of mine aptly calls weapons of mass distraction, right? Because they fragment our consciousness, you know, looking at, at, at economics here and religion there or lack of religion here. I mean, it's, 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 it's a mess. It, it doesn't include the whole picture. Uh, but once we use these categories, we see something else. We see that all of them, and yes, our social and economic system has perpetuated what I've identified in my book, the real wealth of nations as a hidden system of gendered values. Yes, a hidden system of gendered values in which anything stereotypically associated with women or the so-called feminine, like, you know, the work that moms do of caregiving, uh, is considered less valuable than anything stereotypically. This has nothing to do with anything connected with real women and men. Look at all the men who are today diapering babies, feeding babies, doing this, quote, women's work of caregiving, right? Uh, I mean, we, 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 we really have to look at this from a holistic perspective. So what I began to see then is that we must change four cornerstones. And I want to say to you that fortunately, uh, in shifting from a domination system to a partnership-oriented system, so as a matter of degree, of course, uh, and we have already done some of it. We don't have to start from square one. Uh, we can really, I mean, I, I think that the, we, it is very, very important for us to understand this, that we can move to partnership-oriented societies again. And I say again, and I'll go into that uh, more I mean, I, I, I promised Anu I would do the keynote because, you know, it's a, it's a long body of work that I have. But we have the evidence now from archaeology, from even from DNA studies, from linguistics, uh, from anthropology, that actually, you know, you know that story that we're told about that it's always been this way, right? It's just called human nature, like the caveman cartoon. And it's got a club in one hand, a weapon, and he's dragging a woman by the hair in the other hand. I mean, hey, we show that to children before our brains, much less our critical faculties are formed. We've got to change that story because it is not true. The evidence is that for millennia, first in foraging societies and then in early agricultural societies, we lived in societies not ideal, but they were more egalitarian, more gender balanced, and yes, they were less violent. We know now from archaeology that warfare is at the most five to 10,000 years old, which is a drop in the evolutionary bucket. But I'm, I'm going to fast forward again. It isn't just that we have to change, and you can all do this. Uh, educate yourselves, uh, learn what the real truth is about, quote, human nature, uh, that we even get endorphins, neurochemical rewards of pleasure. I mean, my most recent book, Nurturing Our Humanity, goes into that in quite detail. We, we get it not only when we're cared for, but when we care for others, whether it's for a lover, for a child, 
for a friend, for, for a pet. You know, we feel good. I mean, that is human nature, but our brains develop in interaction with our environments, which are cultural. And we, cultures are human creations. We can change them and we have already changed them. In the last 300 years, there has been one progressive social movement challenging actually you know if you read about them in history they sound completely disconnected random but no they all have challenged the same thing they have challenged a tradition of domination think about it what, what was challenged in the enlightenment the so-called divinely ordained right of kings to rule over their quote subjects what was challenged uh, by the feminist movement and now by the women's rights and the Me Too and all of these movements, it was again the so-called divinely ordained right of men to rule over the women and children in their homes, in the quote castles, right? You know, military image. Uh, think about the uh, abolitionist movement then the civil rights, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, again, challenging a so-called divinely ordained right of a, quote, superior race to rule over inferior ones, all the way to the environmental movement, challenging our once hallowed conquest and domination of nature, which at our level of technological development, yeah, could take us to a an evolutionary dead end for our species. So really, the time is now for us to move to a different way of thinking, because if you look at these social movements carefully, as I have done, but you can do the same, you see something very important. They have primarily focused on dismantling the top of the domination pyramid politics and economics as conventionally defined. But what happened is that left in place the foundations on which these systems keep repeating themselves, whether it was Hitler in Germany, uh, Khomeini in Iran, uh, Stalin. I mean, he, well, I, I won't go into details. You can read all about it in my books and in other places. The virtue of having a different framework is that you begin to, I mean, people keep telling me they read my books and it's full of aha moments because things begin to make sense, all right? But look, I there are four cornerstones. I'll go into more detail on them uh, in my next keynote. Their childhood, obviously, because of what we know from neuroscience about the impact of what children experience and observe in the first years, primarily, but also life, of course, uh, but mostly in the first few years, the first five years, uh, on how, how nothing less than our brains develop, and with it how we think, feel, and act, yes, and how we vote. So in Nurturing Our Humanity, by the way, there's a lot about why people voted for Trump. And you know, studies show, and this is all in, in Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, studies show that uh, one thing that uh, when, but, but they're not, these studies are not publicized and you need to publicize them. That is what you need to do, all right? Uh, it, it is, it's consciousness is the first step then action follows. But look, um, why, why would uh, studies show that these people all had, I mean, as, as a rule, generally had very rigid gender stereotypes and had a horror of so-called uppity women, right? Women who said, no, this is wrong, you know, who had the spiritual courage to stand up Against, against injustice, and yes, out of love so often, as moms do. As moms are saying today, hey, 
we need a completely different system. And, um, well, look, uh, uh, what I want to uh, tell you are about the four cornerstones, just mention them, but then focus on what every one of us can do about a very vital cornerstone, economics, uh, which was the subject of my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, which, by the way, not only introduced the model of a caring economics of partnerism, but introduced what nothing, nobody less than President uh, Biden is talking about today, the term human infrastructure. Human infrastructure, people, human beings. Uh, because this system, the old system, hasn't only been bad for mothers, it's been bad for everyone. But let me let me let me finish with the four cornerstones, okay? Uh, one I said is childhood. The other one is gender. Remember, I spoke to you about this gendered system of values. Uh, that's built into domination systems, and it comes with the ranking of one form of humanity, the male form over the female form, which is a model, a template for equating difference, whether it's racial, whether it's religious, you know, whether it's racism, anti-Semitism, uh, anti, you know, homophobia. I mean, it, it is a template for in-group versus out-group thinking. And again, we need to understand these dynamics. These are not accidental. These are built into domination systems. The third is economics, and that's what I'm going to focus on in the rest of our time together and what we can do to move to a caring economics of partnerism. And of course, story and language. We live by stories, and our language is very important. So let me focus now on what I really uh, think is so important, which is uh, what are the most effective steps that every one of us can focus on so that we can accelerate this shift from the domination economics, you know, whether it was a Chinese emperor or a Arab sheik or um, Indian Pasha or the so-called trickle-down supply side economics of so-called neoliberalism. I mean, they, they, they're, they're magicians with words, aren't they? And they're, they're completely misleading because what is trickle-down economics? It is like in feudalism, you know? People were supposed to content themselves with the scraps dropping from the opulent tables of those on top. And this is crazy. Uh, as President Biden said, it's never worked. It never will work. We need a completely different economics, and it starts with giving visibility and value to the real wealth of nations, the contributions of people and of nature. So what are the steps? And I'm going to just talk about four essential steps. The first is, for goodness sakes, let's get away from this old conversation, this old argument about capitalism versus socialism, or socialism versus capitalism. You know, both capitalism and socialism, well, they came out of early industrial times in the 1700s and 1800s. They're outdated, but really the problem goes much deeper. I mean, you know, we're now in the post-industrial era, right? Uh, so, you know, I mean, they are outdated. We're in a different technological era. But it really goes much deeper, and it comes back to this gendered system of values. Because for both Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, and Karl Marx, the so-called father of socialism, uh, there was nothing about caring for nature. Nature was just there to be exploited as for the work of caring for people, yeah, the work that moms do for free in households, um, caring for people's health, caring for children, uh, keeping a clean and healthy 
home environment, uh, which, as I said, then translates also into our planetary environment and caring for it. For them, for both of them, that was just reproductive women's work, not productive work. And you know, that's still taught in our economic schools. We have to change this. You can help change it, okay? Just by making people conscious of how crazy that is. But I, 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 I want to get back to that because, look, uh, if we devalue if we have this gender system of values, there is never going to be enough money for the so-called soft or feminine, right? For caring for people, uh, for supporting moms and other caregivers. And we we'll always have money, as we always seem to, for the stereotypically masculine. And again, it has nothing to do with anything connected with women or men. Uh, this is essential for us to understand that, you know, prisons, why, why is there always money for prisons? Well, think about it. It's the punitive male head of household of domination systems. Why is there always money for weapons and wars? It's the hero as killer, as warrior of our epics. Uh, this devaluation is built into our stories, uh, into what we are taught to value, which really takes us to the second step. And you can all start changing the conversation uh, to really show this. We have to show that caring pays, not only in human and environmental terms, but in purely financial terms. And the Real Wealth of Nations is really full of this information. Uh, for example, uh, companies that regularly appear in the Fortune 500 list as the best companies to work for also are companies that have a higher return to investors. But it isn't only companies, and this is basic now. It is nations. And I want to spend a few moments on that, because think about nations like Norway, like Finland, uh, Sweden was one of the first nations uh, that uh, were so poor in the beginning of the 20th century that there were famines. You know, Minnesota, whole states in the U.S. were populated by people fleeing them. Today, these nations are invariably in the highest ranks of the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Reports. Think about that. But there are also, uh, Finland, for example, has been number one in the world happiness studies. Number one for four consecutive years. Why? Uh, well, I'll tell you why. It is because they have had caring policies that invested in their human infrastructure. Policies um, like universal health care, high quality child care, generous paid parental leave for both mothers and fathers, and so on. So, and no, they are not socialist. They are highly successful precisely because, I mean, they have a highly successful business community precisely because they've invested in their human infrastructure. And no, they didn't do all of this and have caring policies because they're small and homogeneous. They're, think of all the small homogeneous societies that do not invest in caring for their people or caring for nature. The real reason and this is where we come back to the needs for new social categories, for new words, is that they have shifted more to the partnership side of the partnership domination social scale. They have more democracy in both the family, family, that is correct, 
family and the state or tribe. Uh, they have a much higher status of women, so much so that women are today 40 to 50 percent of their national legislatures. I mean, think about that. Uh, if you really want to talk about representative democracy, yeah, <laughs> that is representative democracy. But it's not just women who voted for caring policies. What happens, and this is fundamental, as the status of women rises, men no longer find it such a threat to their status, to their quote masculinity, to also embrace more caring policies. So they often call themselves caring societies. Now, that really takes us to the third cornerstone, because, and that cornerstone, that action, so the third action, not cornerstone, uh, the third action, and you can all play a very important role in that, um, because we really need to create an economics where well, mothers don't just get flowers and candies on Mother's Day, uh, but real support, real support for their essential work of caring and caregiving. And a fundamental tool for this is changing how we measure economic health. And I want to talk about that a little in closing, because GDP is crazy. As you know, that's the conventional measure. But look, GDP actually includes this productive work. Yeah, I remember this distinction still taught in our economic schools between productive and reproductive. It includes this productive work, activities that harm and take life, selling cigarettes, selling unhealthy fast foods, and the resulting medical and funeral costs are all great for GDP. It goes up. But not only does GDP include negatives as positives, it fails to include as productive the work of caring for people in households. Yeah, moms, again, aren't we there? Um, I mean, think about how this perpetuates the hidden system of gendered values. And that is why, uh, look, and by the way, there are studies showing like that if it were included, I mean, the data are there, they just need to be publicized, which is where you come in. There are studies showing that if the work of caregiving, mostly still done by women for free in households, were included in GDP, it would constitute anywhere between 30 to 50% of the reported GDP, depending on how you measure it, because if you measure it only by market value, that's low, isn't it, because of the hidden system of gendered values. All right, now this is why the organization that was formed after the publication of The Chalice and the Blade, by the way, uh, which now is in 57 US uh, editions and um, was just published in Spain, a new translation, and it, it, there's a media firestorm. We have to create here the same media firestorm that is happening in Spain. I mean, we just have to. We have to change consciousness. We have to change the conversation. But we developed at the Center for Partnership Studies, uh, my organization, which is changing its name, by the way, to Center for Partnership Systems, because that's what we're really about. Uh, we have developed new measures of economic health. Uh, we launched the first iteration in 2014, uh, 24 social wealth economic indicators that show the economic value of caring for people starting at birth and caring for a natural uh, life support systems, but 24 metrics, you know, that's a lot. So a fabulous team of economists is now, as we speak, uh, working on updating and condensing uh, this into 
one or two easily acceptable numbers in a social wealth index. And we absolutely need this. First of all, women and mothers need it. I mean, consider that today in the world, the poorest of the poor and the mass of the poor are women and children. That is not necessary. It is a product of the old, yes, old economic and social thinking, which must change. And metrics will provide, the social wealth index will provide policymakers with the information they have lacked. And it will provide President Biden, who talks now today about human infrastructure and a caring economy. It's been co-opted to only mean the care economy. No, we want all policies to be informed by caring for people, starting at birth and caring for nature. So uh, there is a lot here that I've shared with you. But I want to, first of all, invite you all to join me in supporting the index and seeing to it that is adopted by the U.S. government, by U.S. states, and worldwide to support the movement from domination toward a caring economics of partnerism, and yes, to at long last give visibility and real value through policies like universal uh, health care, support for high quality and accessible child care, a paid, generous paid parental leave for both mothers and fathers. We want men to do this work too. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the stereotypes have held both backs, uh, both halves of, of humanity and everybody in between back. Um, we have to help our president uh, to show that investing in human infrastructure is the best investment a nation can make, especially in our post-industrial age. When, you know, it's funny, economists keep telling us uh, that the most important capital for our post-industrial era is high quality human capital. But what they don't tell us is that whether or not we have this, quote, high quality human capital, flexible, resilient, creative people, able to work in teams to really respond appropriately to change rather than to deny climate change or deny election results or, or deny COVID-19. I mean, this is crazy. Uh, that that largely hinges, yes, on the quality of care and education children receive early on, the work of moms. We need parenting education in all of our schools. And by the way, there's a wonderful resource for you that you can get for free at centerforpartnership.org. It's called the Caring and Connected Parenting Guide at centerforpartnership.org. Now, look, I, I want to close, but I just want to remind you all that we do have the power to change. Witness what I told you about how we changed laws, which should be taught not just in women's history. We can, I mean, come on, a, a, a week and then a month for half of humanity should be integrated into the whole curriculum, which I've proposed in another book, Tomorrow's Children. But uh, yeah, I've lived for a long time and written a lot of books. And you can really all uh, change your thinking. That's the first step. And then change every the thinking of everybody in your sphere of influence. If you have contact with government or with media, for goodness sake, contact them, change their thinking. But if, if you don't, do it with your family, do it with your people in your workplaces, do it with the people you work for. This isn't us against them. This is for everyone. We need a new economics of 
care and your caring economics of partnerism. And well, look, I want to close. I just want to say that we can do it. Remember, social and economic systems are human creations. So let's build a caring economics of partnerism. Let's do it for moms and for all of us. And yes, let's do it for our children and generations to come. I thank you. Well, um, I've shared so much information with you. <laughs> I'm not going to cry because I have to jump on another panel this time. But thank you, Rianne. That was just mind blowing as always. And thank you for sharing all your wisdom. Um, we're going to continue onwards with um, Betty Lamar in about five minutes. But if there's any questions, please ask Rianne. It's coming up in the thread. Can you see the thread, Rianne? Are you able to see? Yes. And Kate, I went longer, but of course, we started late. And no, we have all good. All you, all the time, the world will be a much better place, my dear. I just, <laughs> thanks so much. Um, Rian, what? where's the best place if people wanted to reach out to you directly? I'll type it in, uh, in a they, chat. They, uh, they can email center, for part, uh, center at partnershipway.org. Center at partnershipway.org. <laughs> and I really invite everyone to go to, uh, well, they can go to my website. Our websites are all now under reconstruction, just to show you that we're changing things again. <laughs> you're you're um, keeping current. Yes, we're keeping current. But go to centerforpartnership.org. And remember, it really hinges on you. Yeah, that was something that's, that's a train, you know, that I think it is coming back. Every time we point a finger out, there are three more pointing back at us. And there's just no getting away from that, you know, at the end. Individuals can make a difference, but then it's also those individuals gathering within which the organizations work. Then we really start getting some exponential change. Well, we have to change our consciousness. But in order to really uh, be successful, you know, we hear so much about healing ourselves. Well, we have to, healing ourselves in a domination system is like going, trying to go up on a down elevator. We have to change the elevator. And that's the system. And once we understand that, uh, everything falls into place. Yeah, so, so true. Well, Rianne, honestly, thank you so much. I think, um, as always, your um, wisdom, you were way ahead of the curve. And as we were talking today, it feels like the world is starting to kind of catch up a little bit. Um, so we're counting on you to continue to stay ahead, clearly, and, and bring the rest of us along with you. Well, I think that today is the moment and young people in particular are so hungry for a new, a new model of what we can build. And that's what this is all about. It's I agree. Yeah. yeah. I think it's up to us to help give them. They understand the what and that there needs. And so now we need to empower them with the tools um, right. for them to actually, for the tool. Yeah. Well, I thank you, Kate, and I thank Anu. And I'm, I guess we should all jump onto our panel. Yes. I, 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 I te refresh my memory. What am I supposed to do now? Well, with that, I'm just going to say thanks, everybody. Um, Betty Lamar is next. Yay. We're um, excited to hear Betty's knowledge as well. And with that, everyone, enjoy the rest of the program. It's going to be amazing. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure being with you. And thank you especially, Kate and Anu. And I'm going to leave because I think that's what I'm supposed to do. We all are. Myself into the other session. So Sounds good. All right. Be well. Take care. Stay healthy. Wash your hands still. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye. <laughs>